hope you brought a Bible with you, Revelation chapter 8. We're going to jump back into the book of Revelation that continues to paint this picture for us of this great and holy and almighty God, the, the, the one whose name is above every name, that is the name of Jesus. Between now and Labor Day, we're going to get all the way through Uh, the book of Revelation, and so uh, we're going to get back into it today in Revelation chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, and yes, uh, we are going to go through all four chapters. Now here's something that happened. First gathering, I got a little more concerned about filling in the blanks on the outline and went a little long, so I might not get all the blanks in the outline in the exact order they are, I just want you to grab a hold of this story. I I want you to know that when when this book was written, when this letter came, it came to the church, as it came to the church, the church gathered, and it was read out loud to them. They, they listened and they took it in and they didn't have time to, to go through all of, the, all of the details. What they got was the picture and what they got was an overall picture and the, the picture was that this was a singular revelation, a revelation about Jesus Christ. John, uh, revelation chapter 1 verse 1 says the revelation of Jesus Christ. My friend, this is a picture of Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus who sits on his throne. It's a picture of Jesus who rules the universe. It's a picture of God who is sovereign above all. It's the picture and the revelation of Jesus. He's the name above all all names, and he's our great God. It's a, it's a singular picture. It's one picture. As we, as we go through the, it's, it's, it's one revelation. As we go through, we, we said there's an image that we want to, want to keep in mind, and the image that we want to keep in mind, uh, very simply, uh, is this image. It's the image of the throne. Uh, Revelation chapter 4 opens up as John is ushered up into heaven. The first thing he sees, and I saw a throne and one seated on it. And it takes us back to what the prophet Jeremiah said, that a glorious throne set on high from the beginning has been our place of sanctuary, has been our place of safety. It's an image that over and over again, John the Revelator wants us to focus in when everything that's going on in your world, when all hell breaks loose against you, don't take your eyes off the throne because there is one who is seated on it. He is sovereign, and he is supreme, and he is the authority, and he is in control. Everything that's happening is passed through his hand, and this is this picture of the one who's seated on his throne in his name. It's Jesus. He's a, he, he looks, John says, kind of like, like a lamb that's been slaughtered, but standing. And it's a picture that he, that he went to the cross, and he died to death, that our substitutes suffer so that we could have victory, which, which leads to the next thing. There's, there, there's one, one word that you and I need to keep in mind when we think about the revelation. One, one image is the throne, one word, and, and you know the word. There's the word. Some of you might even have it on a piece of apparel or on your shoes today. It's Nike. It's the Greek word for victory. And if you think about revelation, you think about one revelation, Jesus Christ, and you think about one image, the throne, think about one word, And every time you see the word plastered on our billboard, or every time you see the word on somebody's shirt, or you see the swoosh on somebody's shoes, remember, that that's revelation. And the word means victory. And I think the central verse, we haven't got there in Revelation chapter 17, but I think the central verse for us is this. These shall war against the Lamb, and the Lamb shall conquer them, for He is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they shall also conquer that are with Him. That's you, called and chosen and faithful. That victory is yours, that you're more than conquerors through Him that loved us. One word. Nike, victory. One image, Jesus on the throne. And one picture, Jesus himself. As this is painted out. If you're just kind of jumping in with us in the study of Revelation, and it's taken me a long time to get to chapter 8, um, I did a sermon a few months ago called a Revelation in 30 Minutes or Less. You can find it on our, our website, and it'll kind of get you up to speed. And it gives you an overview of the, of the, of the book. But my friends, the book of Revelation, this, this one revelation of Jesus Christ, this, this one image of the throne, and this one word, Nike, this victory, it ultimately leads to one response. Let's not miss the point. The book of Revelation was not written to promote speculation about the future. The book of Revelation was written and remains in our Bible to promote action in the present. And we can get caught up in all of the details, and we'll see in one of the passages of Scripture, chapter 9, that we deal with today, it's led to very wild and bizarre interpretations that Revelation chapter 9 says that there are going to be Apache attack helicopters. And that's how some people have interpreted Revelation chapter 9. And we'll see that that is an inconsistent picture. Because most of us have this desire to know about the end times, but the book, the letter was written not to promote speculation about the future, but to prompt Christ-like action in the presence, in the present, and there's only one response. And that response from God's people is worship. The only proper response is worship. 
And that's not just wonderful music like we've had together today. Worship comes in, in three facets. Worship is, is for us to pray fervently for the God's kingdom to come. Worship is for us to proclaim fearlessly the gospel of Jesus Christ. And worship for us is to praise faithfully the one who sits on his throne. That even when all hell breaks loose against us. And I want you to remember with me, it's important to understand that as we go through the book of Revelation, it breaks down into seven sections. And the seven sections are are parallel sections to one another. It's not like, well, chapters one through three happen the first, and then chronologically, then it's four through seven, and then it's eight through 11. No, no, no. It's, it's It's one picture of one period of time, the time of Jesus' first appearing to the time of Jesus' second appearing, the time that we're living in. The book of Revelation is written for real people in real places in real times with real needs, with real hurts, and the fact that hell is broken loose against us. That's for us today. But again, it's not a call to promote speculation about the future, but to prompt action in the present. So check this out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some of this. Let's get going. Uh, when he opened the seventh seal, that's how chapter 8 starts. He goes, who's he? Well, he's this, this lamb that was slain. This is the, the lamb that also looks like a lion. Is a slain lamb that was standing. Remember, uh, as Revelation 1 through 3, the first section is painted. We see Jesus Christ amongst the seven churches, real people in real times and real places. And we understand that the church exists as light to a world that lies in darkness. Chapters 4 through 7 then remind us again a second parallel section from Jesus' first appearing to his second appearing. Chapter 4 through 7 says, says uh, darkness hates the light, so conflict is unavoidable. And he says, I'm standing in heaven and I saw this picture of, of, of a throne and one seated on it, but there were some tears going on in heaven because, because someone had in his hand a, a scroll. It was a giant scroll and it held the, the future, but it was sealed up with seven seals and there was no one worthy to open the scroll. And so I began to weep and someone came to me and said, don't cry because there's one who's worthy to open the seals. We find that it's Jesus who's worthy to open the seals and he begins to open them. One, two, three, four, five. And he opens these seals and, and when he gets to the sixth seal, we're, we're amazed because he, he, he gets to the sixth seal and he says, hey, uh, there's some angels. I, I want them to go to the four corners of the universe and I want them to hold back the winds because I'm not going to unleash my final judgment yet. They're going to hold it back. And chapter seven is filled with, why is he holding it back? We see chapter seven because he's got, I've got my people and I need to protect them. So I'm going to give them the, the seal, my seal on their foreheads. And nothing can harm them and nothing can take them out. And so chapter 7 is that, and we, get, and we get there, and we're like, okay, okay, now we're sealed, we're protected. Now, now give me the seventh seal. If the, if the sixth seal was waiting for God to hold back his judgment, what's the seventh seal going to be? It's going to be when God unleashes it, and then he opened the seventh seal. And there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. When was the last time you were silent in front of God? Have you, have you ever had an experience, a moment, when something so captivated your attention that you didn't know what to do and you just sat in stunned silence. Some of you recently maybe have been to a movie theater. I've heard several people, and this was my experience, uh, after you watched the movie American Sniper and it's over and the theater sat in silence and nobody moved. Have you ever had a moment where there's such an expectation of awe and anticipation and expectation for God to act? All you could do was sit in silence. And he opened the seventh seal and there was silence, a holy hush in heaven for about half an hour. And it's consistent with the prophet Zechariah, the prophet writes, be silent all flesh before the Lord for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. God's about ready to act and the proper response on our part is silence. When's the last time you've been silent in front of God? Because out of all for who he is and anticipation for what he's going to do and expectation for him to act on your behalf, the only proper response is silence. When's the last time you've been silent in front of God? Okay, okay, get uh, silence in heaven for about half an hour. Uh, get, get to the trumpets. What's going to happen now? We're going to see seven trumpets. And I saw seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given them. Would you circle that word given if you're following along in your Bible, that word given? It occurs over and over and over throughout the scripture, uh, throughout Revelation. And it's a picture that God is supreme and nothing happens that God doesn't allow to pass through his hand. He's going to give the angel seven trumpets. We're going to see in a little bit, he's going to give the key to hell to a star. 
But God's constantly giving things, and he's given seven angels, seven trumpets. Okay, we'll get to the trumpets. What are the trumpets? And another angel I saw who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar before the throne. Oh, yeah, by the way, there's a throne and one seated on it. And in front of the throne, there's an altar. And this angel this, takes this censer and he takes the prayers of all God's people and, and, he, and he brings them to the altar. It says, the smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from that angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Do you see what happens? Prayer works! John, the revelator, is trying to remind God's people in a real place, in a real time, with real hurts and real needs, and hell is unleashed against them. Don't stop praying. One of the responses in worship is to pray fervently for God's kingdom to come down. It's fascinating, isn't it? The the, the prayers of God's people can't reach the altar on their own. It needed an angel to come along and incense their prayers to reach the altar. My friends, that's the ministry of Jesus Christ. God's word says that that Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father to make intercession on our behalf. When we don't know what to pray and when our prayers seem so primitive and our prayers seem so weak, Jesus takes our prayers and he incenses them and he places them in front of God the Father on our behalf. And prayer works. And the same angel who incenses these prayers and puts them in front of God the Father, he responds to the prayers. And he takes that same censer that carried the incense and he goes to the altar and he grabs up fire and he hurls it on the earth. And it's a reminder of those people, real people in real time, in real place, that hell is broken loose against them. Prayer works. Your cry goes up, and God's kingdom comes down. This guy, John, who we believe wrote this book, this letter, is a follower of Jesus. He was one of his 12 disciples. And on one occasion, the disciples, while Jesus was walking planet Earth, came to Jesus and said, hey, hey Jesus, teach us how to pray. You remember? He said, okay, you want to know how to pray? Here's how you pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in, here it is in real life, it's happening. God hears our prayer and he responds to our cries. Our cries go up and heaven's kingdom comes down. My friends, that's why we pray. When's the last time you sat in silence? When's the last time you fervently prayed to God to act on your behalf? My friend, if you don't know what to pray, if there's something in hell has been unleashed against you and you're backed into a corner and and your dreams have been crushed by Satan and you don't know what to do, get on your knees and pray. And Jesus will take them and he will incense your prayers and he will put them on the altar of God the Father and God will respond. Maybe not in the time and maybe not in the exact way that you want, but God will answer your prayer. His kingdom will come down in your life. And that's before we get to the seven trumpets. He wants us to know that prayer is effective. Don't quit praying. Don't quit praying. Our cries go up. What if? What if God is really the God who sees your misery, who hears your cries, and who will act on your behalf? Don't you think you ought to ask him to? No matter how small it is. If he's that kind of God, and I I would submit to you he is, pray like you've never prayed before. Well, I don't know what to say. Don't worry so much about what you say because Jesus has to incense your prayers anyway. And that's his promise to do it on our behalf. So finally, then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. I need to say to you a word about trumpets in the scriptures. Trumpets in the scriptures, I I want you to understand, serve various functions, but there are two main functions for trumpets in the scriptures. Uh, Function number one is they serve as a warning. They're sounded as a warning. Hey, calamity's about to happen. Get prepared. Be ready. The trumpet sounds. Uh, maybe you need to run back into the walls of the city because there's an opposing force coming. C- come back in. They sound a warning. And all throughout chapter, these seven trumpets, chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, the trumpet sound, and they were a warning to people who haven't put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They're a warning. God is the righteous judge. God is holy. He's the king of kings. Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back this time, he's coming with judgment. You need to be ready. These trumpets serve as a warning. But the second thing the trumpets do, they not only serve as a warning, trumpets serve as a call to war for God's people. They serve as a warning for people who don't know Jesus. They serve as a call to war for those of us who do. Now, I need to be incredibly careful here. I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. This is not a call to war as in Islamic jihad. Uh, This is not even a call to war like, unfortunately, was done in the name of our God during the Crusades. 
This is a call to spiritual warfare. The, the scriptures say that you and I battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power. The scriptures say that the weapons of our warfare are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. As we learn to take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. Paul, when he writes to the church at Ephesus, he's, he's going to say, hey, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wily attacks of the devil. The scriptures say that our enemy, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. My friend, the attack is real, our battle is fierce, and there is an enemy who wants to destroy you. This is warfare language, and it serves as a call. Remember, it's not to promote speculation about the future. It's to compel action in the present, to act as God would have us to act. And so chapter 8 continues, the first angel sounded his trumpet, and I, I want you to see that the, that the first four trumpets sound, and it's, it's systematic judgment, uh, systematic uh, destruction of the created order. Trumpet one sounds, and this, this, this hail comes down from heaven, which, by the way, I need you to keep in mind as you're reading Revelation 8, 9, 10, and 11, what these people who are hearing it for the first time would have had in mind. Two stories. Story number one is the story of the Exodus. <laughs> that God, they cried out to God in their misery because they've been enslaved by the Egyptians. Uh, they cried out to God, God, do something about our misery. And God hurled fire from heaven. You remember where it landed? In a bush <laughs> that caught on fire and burned, and God spoke to it through the bush. God spoke to Moses. And God says, hey, Moses, I chose you, go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, hey, the God who will be known by what he does said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, I don't know that God. Moses said, okay, watch out. And ten plagues, remember the plagues that came? And so they hear these things, and you're going to hear there, there's fire, I mean, there's hail, and there's blood, and there's a locust, and they're going to hear these things in Revelation 8, 9, 10, and 11, and they're going to be going back to that story, that God heard our misery, he he, he saw our misery, he heard our cry, and he rescued us, and he delivered us. And Oh yeah, that was warning. Those things didn't affect us. Remember, they were saved. God said these plagues are coming, and if, if, you, if you don't want to be destroyed by them, I want you to take the blood of the lamb, and I want you to sprinkle it on the, the doorpost and on the mantle of the door. And when the death angel comes over, he will pass over your house so that you're not destroyed. That's story number one. Story number two they'd have in mind is the story of, of Jericho, the battle of Jericho. You, you remember Joshua at the battle of Jericho, right? And the walls came uh, tumbling down, right? God, God gave seven trumpets to seven priests and said, march around the city for seven days. And when I say blow, I will give you this city and this land in victory, the land that I promise you. Two stories that they have in mind. So trumpets serve as a warning to those who don't know Jesus. They serve as a, as a call to war for those of us who do. And trumpet number one sounds, and hail mixed with fire comes down to heaven. And a third of the earth is destroyed. A third of the land is destroyed. Trumpet number two sounds, and, and a thing like a mountain falls into the sea, and the sea turns to blood, one of the plagues, the water turning to blood, and, and the sea turns to blood, and a third of the seas, and a third of the ships that are on the seas, and a third of the life that's under the seas, destroyed. Trumpet number three sounds, and this meter, like this thing comes falling out of heaven, and it lands in the river, and a third of the fresh water supply that they got from the livelihood, it turns bitter and it's no longer able to drink, and a third of the water supply is destroyed. And trumpet number four sounds, and a third of the sun, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars grow dark. Darkness continues to spread across the planet. It's a systematic, it's, it, it, it's, it's the destruction, the systematic physical judgments on the planet earth and it reminds us a couple of things. It reminds us there's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to go if you don't know Jesus. And if you put your trust in the created order, if you put your thing, trust in the things of this earth, just know that it's going to be destroyed. Trumpets one through four, the systematic physical judgment on the planet. And the plagues, they're, 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 they're references back to the plagues and, and they'd remember. I know what happened through those plagues. God kept us safe because God is a rescuer and a redeemer. And so they're listening and they're, they're not so much caught up in the details as in the overarching story. And the story is, oh yeah, we remember the plagues and we remember our history and God rescued us. God's on his throne and he's going to rescue us again. Even though all hell has been unleashed against us. Then trumpets five and six, they're no longer about physical judgment. They're, they're about this intense personal judgment. 
against those who continue to live with immorality and idolatry. Chapter 9 starts, oh, before we get to chapter 9, I, I need to, you to see this. Chapter 8, verse 13 says, As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in the midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. You know what the eagle's saying, right? You ain't seen nothing yet. You think those three things were terrifying. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about your worst nightmare. Double it. Now double it again because it's about ready to come true. Trumpet number five. Chapter nine. Um, The fifth angel sounded his trumpet. And I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Uh, Remember, Jesus' disciples had had been out uh, performing uh, ministry and there were certain things that they couldn't do. And they said, hey Jesus, how come we, how come we couldn't take care of this? And Jesus said, that, that, those kind of only come about by prayer and fasting. And in that same scenario, when Jesus is telling them this, he, he tells them um, that Satan fell from heaven like a star. That Satan, this angel that was created to honor and glorify God, basically said to God, I want your throne. I'm not content with my place. I want your throne. And God said no, and there was war in heaven, and God cast Satan, Hasatan, Lucifer, Michael the Archangel, cast him out of heaven, and he came to earth. So that's the star, it's the devil. And he was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke of a gigantic furnace. You get the picture, smoke billowing up. Others. Uh, the sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. Not only that God caused a third of the sun to darken, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, but now everything else is darkening because of the smoke. Isn't that the picture of what hell does when it breaks out against you? It darkens the light. Because you see, darkness can't stand the light. and Darkness wants to, to destroy the light. It just wants to cloud the light. And so Satan, and it, and it begins to darken the sun. It says, now out of the smoke... Locusts came down on the earth, and automatically these people, oh yeah, I remember that plague back in Egypt, locusts. And the locusts came down, and it destroyed the land of Egypt. But these locusts aren't allowed to destroy the land. And they were given, check that out, there's that word again, they were given power like that of scorpions on the earth. What we're going to find out about these, 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 these things that come down from heaven that are like locusts, they move with the speed of a chariot, and they sting with the sting of a scorpion. And they've come for one purpose. And their purpose, very simply, is to harm not the land, they're told, in fact, out of the smoke the locusts were given, came down on earth, power like that of the scorpions. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or the plant of the tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They're not allowed to harm God's people, but, but other people they've come to harm. And agony, and the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of the scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but they will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. And what we find out is that these locust-like creatures who move with the speed of a chariot and sting with the sting of a scorpion, they've come to torment human beings, but they're only allowed to do it for five months. Don't get caught up in what the five months is. The people who heard it for the first time would say, oh, it's only for a limited amount of time. It doesn't last. Maybe it's the life, the lifespan of a of, of a of a locust. Maybe it's the the time when they can do their damage. I don't know, but it's it's this is for a limited amount of time. This is for a limited amount of time. This is for a limited amount of time. But here's where I want you to zero in. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek Apion, that is destroyer. In Hebrew and Greek, the word translates the same, destroyer. You remember? Jesus said these words, recorded by this guy John. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and what's the next word, anybody? Destroy. Same word. His purpose is the same, my friend. Our battle is fierce. There is an enemy that wants to destroy you, and those that work on his behalf are fighting against you. But you need to be reminded it's limited in nature. And these people cannot harm you if you have Jesus Christ as your Savior. Verse 12, the first woe is past. The two other woes are to come. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet. And I heard a voice coming from the four corners, from the four horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, 
trumpets. Release the four angels who are bound in the great river Euphrates the, that are held off at the border. And the four angels who had been kept, these four angels had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of the world's population. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard the number, John says, 200 million more horse-like creatures were let loose on the planet and their sole purpose was to destroy a third of the human population. Take your worst nightmare, double it, and double it again, and double it again. It's about ready to become true because now not only have a third of the earth, a third of the sea, a third of the rivers, a third of the stars, the moon, the sun, but now a third of the population has been wiped out. And trumpets serve as a warning. If you do not have your life right with God through faith and trust in Jesus, get right with God because God is coming back. He's the coming king, he's the righteous judge, and he is the merciful God, and there's still time to receive his mercy. Do it now. I, I, I need to pause just for a second. Verse 17 says this, The horse and riders I saw in my vision look like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads, they had heads of horses that resembled the heads of lions, and out of the mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. My friends, this passage of Scripture, I just want you to know, one of the common interpretations of that in the modern-day world is that this is a reference to Apache attack helicopters owned by Americans. That is a dangerous interpretation. Just go back in history a little bit and you'll understand that before Apache attack helicopters, it was referenced that these were the most uh, powerful fighting tanks that existed. It's not talking about that kind of warfare, my friends. It is a picture. It is a picture that says death and destruction is coming. Be ready. Don't get so caught up. It's not to promote speculation in the future, but to prompt action in the present. So watch the action. Check this out with me. Verse 20 of chapter 9. The rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. Trumpets serve as a warning. Repent. Get right with God through faith and trust in Jesus. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. The trumpet sounded, repent. But it seems to me that the more severe the punishment, the greater the rebellion. And the people just don't repent. And the trumpets sound a warning. And I would just submit to those of you who are worshiping something other than God, you become exactly like what you worship. And in this case, these idols are referred to as, as blind, deaf, and lifeless. And I would submit to you that if you're worshiping something that is blind, deaf, and lifeless, you too will become blind, deaf, and lifeless. The only place you find life in worship is through Jesus. The thief came to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, I have come that you might have, anybody? Life and have it more abundantly. More and better life than you've ever dreamed of. That's the only place you can get. It's the only place where you get vision. It's the only place where you hear. But these people hadn't heard and they continued to rebel. My friends, idols that you worship, and there are many of them, they promise you delight, but I promise you they only end in death. Worship God. Six trumpets. I want to know about the seventh trumpet. This thing's just getting good, right? What's going to happen? When's the final day of God's judgment? Chapter 10. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like that of the sun. His legs were filled, uh, were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll. Not the big scroll that was sealed, because that's been broken. It's a little scroll. It's a different word. It's a little scroll. And he holds it open in his hand. It's, the scroll's open. He laid open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. That's got to be a big angel, right? And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. Check that out. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write uh, what they wrote, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And hit pause here to remind you. We don't have all the information. We will never have all the information. So for those who are trying to make timelines and they say they do it according to the scriptures and they're trying to lay out this is exactly when Jesus is going to come back, nobody has all the information. God has said, I'm keeping some of that information for myself. No human being can figure it out, friends. We're not to promote speculation about the future. We're supposed to prompt action in the present. I don't, I'd like to know what the seven thunders had to say. But God says, no, you don't get to know that. Because it's really not about that. It's about what I want you to do in the present. 
Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in them, the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. Get ready. This is going to happen. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servant the prophets. What's the mystery of God? Here it is, friends. According to the gospel, the mystery of God very simply is this. Our God wins. Our God wins. That, that's the mystery of the gospel. That even when it doesn't seem like it, our God wins. Even when all hell has broken loose against you, our God wins. Even when the situation that you think is impossible, our God wins. Even in the thing you don't think God can do, our God wins. And it's this picture, our God wins, our God wins. And then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and the land. I don't know about you, but I'd have a little bit of fear and trembling right there. This angel who's big enough to have one foot in the sea and one foot on the land, who's got an open scroll in his hand, now I'm supposed to go ask the angel for the scroll. I'm moving with a little bit of caution. So I went to the angel and I asked him. (laughs) He knew better than just to snatch it out of his hand, didn't he? I asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. So I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it. It tasted sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again and again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. This is common prophetic language. In the Old Testament, God says to other prophets, uh, see the book, I think what's in the angel's hand is the word of God. He says, I want you to take it. I want you to eat it. He said, I want it to become yours. I want you to know it. I want you to digest it. And I want you to meditate on it. I want you to think about it so that what comes out of you are my words. You see, God wants to speak to us so that he can speak through us. And he says to the prophet, I want you to take and eat it. But, but here's what I want you to know. When you eat it, when you take it in, it's going to be sweet because it's God's promises and it's God's hope. And you have a relationship with me through faith and trust in Christ. But when you swallow it and it gets all the way down to your stomach, it's going to turn bitter because now you know you have to proclaim it. Because a prophet's task is to prophesy. What does it mean to prophesy? It means to speak. It means to speak. I, I grow tired. And, and I've been guilty myself. I grow tired of hearing Christians say, oh yeah, I preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, I'll use words. Baloney. That's the Hebrew word, baloney. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Prophecy. Read chapters 10 and 11 sometime and go through and circle the word prophesy or prophecy. You're going to see it six times because that's our task. Our task is clear and our task is prophetic. And it means to speak. What does it mean to speak? A prophet speaks God's word to God's world about what's going on now in light of what we know will happen in the future. And what we know will happen in the future very simply is this. He will come back as the king of kings. He will come back as the righteous judge. And he will come back as the merciful Lord. And we need to be ready and we need to speak it. We need to boldly and fearlessly proclaim the gospel. That's part of worship. So John eats the scroll. Uh, Maybe I could put it this way to you. I think that's... Next, yeah, here. Here's, here's what I believe. I think uh, God will speak to you so that he can speak through you so that he can co- accomplish something beyond you. God has a great work for you to do. God has things for you to do that you have not even imagined yet. But the only way that's going to become a reality is if you let God speak to you so that he can speak through you and he will accomplish something beyond you. My friends, never forget that. Never doubt it. Then we get to chapter 11, and I need to move through this quickly. As I move through this quickly, it says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and its worshipers, but exclude the outer court, do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months, and I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. My friend, I would tell you from that part of the scriptures that our God dwells in us. When he says he goes measure the temple, he's not talking about a literal temple in heaven. He's not talking about the temple in Jerusalem. God's people at this point, when they hear temple, they would know we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells in us, and they would be reminded, don't forget, your God dwells in you. He is inside of you. He will go ahead of you. He will walk alongside of you, and he will come after you. Our God dwells in us, and it makes them understand our lives are secure. Measure the temple, that part of the ground that's not going to be destroyed this time. 
And that's you, and God says, you're secure and you're protected. Our suffering is expected. It said they will trample on the holy city, my friend, you're going to suffer. They're not going to be allowed to harm you. They're not going to be allowed to kill you, but there is suffering and all hell will break loose against you. And you need to understand that suffering is to be expected. Our task is prophetic. Prophesy the two witnesses. Some people think that they're two literal people. I don't think that. I think it's a picture of the church as a whole during the time between which Jesus came the first time and the time he will come the second time who are called to be his prophets. Our task is prophetic. Our message is clear. Now you see that it says they'll be in sackcloth because we understand like John, it's sweet to, like honey in our mouths, but it's bitter in our stomach to look at somebody and say, if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your savior, hell will be your final destination. And that's not fun, but our message is clear. Our light is unquenchable. Look what it says. There are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they shall stand before the Lord of the earth. Even though light ha- or darkness hates light, you're the light of the world. Let your light so shine before others that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Our light is unquenchable. Our souls are untouchable. <laughs> if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. The enemies that fight against you cannot harm you. You have the ability to conquer them. One word, Nike. You're victorious. Don't live defeated. Our souls are untouchable. Our power is invincible. They have the power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have the power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. And they remember the plague. Hey, a guy like Moses did that. And he wasn't perfect. Maybe God can use me too. Our power is invincible. Then it says these two witnesses are going to die. And I would remind you that our death is temporary. Because it talks not just about their death, as they lay in the streets of Jerusalem and people mock and people gloat and people send gifts back to one another. The church is dead, the church is dead, the church is dead. <laughs> it says um, three and a half days later. I love third day stories, don't you? Our resurrection will be sure. Our resurrection will be sure. But after three and a half days, the breath of the life of God will enter them and they will stand on their feet and terror will strike those who see them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here and they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. The second one was past, the third one was coming. Our resurrection will be sure, and our mission will be complete. Why God has left us on the planet, we're done. And now we're in heaven with him. What happens when we get to heaven? The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, and if you're able, I'm going to try to, try to get out of the way here, and I want you to... Uh, Read this out loud with me, if you would, please. The seventh angel, if you can see it, sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, let's read together, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. My friend, you read through that and you come to understand very quickly that our God will be glorified, that we will behold his majesty, that his judgments will be final, his servants will be rewarded, his enemies will be destroyed. And then there's this interesting move. There's this interesting move. It's almost, it's almost a throwaway. But remember, you're the first hearers, and you're, and you're zeroed in on this story, and you're zeroed in on your history, and you don't have to worry about all the details because it's not about speculation about the future. It's about, uh, it's about action in the present. Verse 19, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen, what? The ark the covenant and it takes them back to the story of the exodus as they're journeying through the wilderness God says I want you to build a tabernacle for me and in the tabernacle I want you to build a holy of holies a a place where only the the high priest can go once a year and inside the holy holies I I want you to put an ark it's uh, you know some people say about three feet long by about two feet wide by about a foot and a half high Uh, let me show you this in the catacombs uh, outside, outside of Rome the catacombs outside of Rome. Uh, here, here's a painting. 
the wall of one of the catacombs. Can, can you see on the two sides the lampstands, the two lampstands, the, the menorahs? And right in the middle is a picture of the Ark of the Covenant because this is so prominent in their history. And what they know is we're going to be welcomed by the mercy of our God. The Ark of the Covenant serves to remind these people of three things. First of all, it serves to remind them of the divine presence of God. The divine presence of God. The ark was the place where God dwelt. In fact, you read through 1 Samuel chapter 4 and you see that it says that this is where the Lord sits enthroned. <laughs> Remember, there's one image. A throne. And here it is again presented as the ark of the covenant. Oh yeah, there's a throne. That's where God sits. That's where God dwells. That's where he is. And he's with us. Reminds them of God's divine presence. It reminds them of God's divine provisions. Do you remember one of the things that's in the Ark of the Covenant? The manna. Those are going through the Exodus. God provided them manna to eat. Best I can tell is kind of like a vanilla wafer. Uh, that's, that's the best I can come up with. But every single day, they got manna. And God said to Moses, take a bunch of that manna, put it in this golden pot, and put that pot in there, and it won't go bad. It's a reminder of God's provisions. God provides for you daily. Then ultimately, it's also a picture of God's divine protection. Those of you who are Indiana Jones fans, you'll know, in Raiders of the Lost Ark, that everywhere the ark goes, their victory is promised, right? Indy wasn't going to find the ark, friends, because we know where it is. It's in heaven. The top of the ark, by the way, the lid, two angels. And it forms a seat, and it's called the mercy seat. And when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies once a year, he puts two things on the mercy seat as a reminder. And these people know this. They know their story. They know their history. You know what he puts on the mercy seat? Incense. To be reminded that our God hears and answers prayer. You know the second thing he puts on top of the mercy seat? Lamb's blood. To remind them that God promised the victory through the Lamb's blood, Jesus Christ. My friend, will you come to the mercy seat today? When all hell's broken out against you, come to the throne of God and find His divine presence, His divine provision, and His divine protection. Almighty God, in this moment, right here, right now, we don't want to speculate about the future. We feel compelled to, act, compelled to action in the present. God, for the one who's never asked Jesus to be their Savior, and no matter how increasingly they see the punishment, that their rebellion is getting greater, God, I pray that this day you would soften their heart and that they would say, Jesus, come into my life. I accept you as my substitute sufferer. I come to your mercy seat. And I don't understand it, but I believe the death that you died on the cross, the blood you shed, can take away my sin. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, forgive my sin. God, for the one who needs to come before your mercy seat with prayer, thank you that you will incense them with the prayers of Jesus, that you will hear our cry, and that you will respond with fire from heaven on our behalf. God, we surrender to you what we need to in prayer. God, we worship you by faithfully proclaiming Jesus and his power. God, help us to be bold and to fearlessly proclaim. And God, may we spend the rest of our days praising you. May we be faithful to say we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I missed one thing. Uh, it's a different thing than I missed the first gathering, so that's progress, I guess. Um, just so you don't miss it, as in Revelation 11 it says, we give thanks to you, Lord uh, God Almighty, the one who is and who was. There's something missing there from what we've seen in other places of Revelation. It used to be the one who is, who was, and anybody know? Is to. He already came. <laughs> He's no longer the one who is to come. He's the one who's come into your life, who dwells inside of you, who can change your life. Would you trust him? Uh, would you stand with me for a word of blessing and benediction? And while you're standing, uh, three things. If you're a guest, and you're here for the first time, right out these doors as soon as I'm done. We're having a 10-minute party. I'd love to meet you. I'd love to say thank you for being here, and we've got a gift for you. Uh, secondly, I have some thank yous. First, uh, I want to say thank you to Aaron, who has so wonderfully led us in worship the last couple of weeks. Would you tell uh, Aaron, thank you for being here and being with us. Absolutely. 
And then I want to say a word of thanks uh, to Mike Furl, who did such an incredible job last week uh, preaching in my absence. So would you tell Mike thank you? Uh, I, I, I told the folks this morning that I've heard great feedback about Mike. I've listened online. I've, I've watched myself, and he did just this incredible job. But mainly the most feedback I've gotten is people said, hey, Tim, uh, you can learn a thing or two from Mike, which absolutely I can. But the, but the thing they told me I should learn how to do is tell a joke. They said, he knows how to tell a joke and get a laugh. And so uh, I'm going to do some work with Mike and maybe learn how to tell a joke or two. Um, friends, God has called you to respond in the moment. Would you fill it out on the back of your card? Would you put it in one of the red bowls? There'll be some folks here with lanyards around their necks. They would love to talk with you and pray with you. God has compelled you to act. Will you be obedient? Almighty God, thank you so much for meeting us in this place. Now, my brothers and sisters and all who are listening, God, you've compelled us to act. May we no longer just want to speculate about the future, but may we look forward to the day when that last trumpet shall sound, when time shall be no more, and we spend eternity with you. And until then, may we be faithful to pray. May we be fearless to proclaim. And may we frequently praise your name. Father, pour your blessings on my friends, on their families, on their households. Protect them. In Jesus' name I pray. Should Jesus not come back before then, I look forward to seeing you next week. We'll see you.